welcome to this lecture on risk analysis approaches in fire safety engineering. This is the first and hopefully long series of free lectures provided to you by the Fire Research Group. My name is Daniel Nilsson and I'm one of the directors of the Fire Research Group, FRG, which is a New Zealand based company. But I'm also a professor at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand. My research is in the area of human behavior in fire and evacuation. And in recent years, I've looked a lot at the use of virtual reality as a tool to collect data on human behavior in fire. But I'm also interested in research in the area of fire safety engineering. The outline of the presentation today is as follows. First, I'll present a study by Pate Cornell from 1996. This was a revolutionary study when it was done in 1996. Pate Cornell looked at risk analysis approaches that had been used uh, around the US and she tried to categorize them. And the way she categorized them was quite clever. She categorized them in terms of how they treat the uncertainty. So when you do a risk analysis, it is to handle the uncertain. And you can do that with different degrees of sophistication. And she divided the risk analysis approaches she looked at into different levels of treatment of uncertainty. And that's level zero to five. And I'll tell you a bit more about this. Now, why are we interested in this? Well, the reason for that is that one of the main documents in ISO, ISO is the standardization organization, one of the main documents in ISO is ISO 23932. The latest version is from 2018 and it's called General Principles. And this document describes how you do risk analysis in fire safety engineering and how you design buildings. Now, the approach that was used was basically Pate Cornell's approach. And that is why I'll start to explain Pate Cornell and then I'll talk about ISO 23932. Finally, I'll tell you a bit more about where to go if you want to learn more, if you want to study on your own, or if you want to take university courses. I'll give you some tips on what could be worth, uh, what courses could be worth taking. Now, what is a risk analysis? Well, before we can answer that question, let's have a look at what a risk is. Now, a risk is the, the common definition or the common agreement is that a risk is a combination in some way of the frequency and consequence. This is an often used definition. Now, you can weigh them together in different ways. The classical engineering way is to say that the risk is just the frequency multiplied by the consequence. So if you measure the consequence in terms of fatalities and then the frequency and number of times per year, you might get a risk measure, which is fatalities per year. Relatively straightforward, but it doesn't always fit. It works in many cases. So there are other ways of, of quantifying the risk. So for example, you can use a risk matrix, which is, it's not really quantitative, it's more towards the qualitative uh, approach. Uh, you might just not just look at individual risk, but you might look at societal risk. And the reason for that is that society as a whole, they're not readily, um, well, they don't accept a hundred people dead in the fire as as easily as one person dead in a fire. So you might have some risk aversion, so you might use societal risks. So there are many different ways. What in engineering, in fire safety engineering, the classical approach is typically frequency multiplied by consequence. But as I said, there are other ways as well. Now, why do we need a risk analysis? Where if we're looking at fire safety engineering, we need a risk analysis to estimate how safe a building is and to see if it is safe enough. One of the problems with fire is that it is a, it is a rare occurrence. It doesn't happen that often. We don't have complete information about how often fires happen. We do have statistics, but for one specific building, it might be quite hard to determine how often a fire occurs, particularly if it's a new or a complex building that has never been built before. So we need a tool for estimating how dangerous is the building. So what is the risk? And then we need to compare that risk to some type of tolerability criteria. So is this building safe enough? And often the way we do it in fire safety engineering is that we develop scenarios. So a scenario is a chain of events that happens. So we're looking at what can happen. So will people die, for example? How often does this happen and how severe is it? How many people die? 
And then we find these scenarios uh, often and, and we figure out the combined contribution to the overall risk and we see if this measure of the overall risk is acceptable or not. Now this is quite tricky often since it is a lot of unknown factors and a fire is a relatively rare event. In most buildings you might not even have a fire during the lifetime of a building but it still needs to be safe enough. So in this case risk analysis is a good approach to estimate how dangerous a building is and if it is safe enough. Now when we do a risk analysis we need to handle the uncertainty since when we do this type of analysis it's a rare event it's unknown how dangerous it is and we're doing estimates now we can do it very accurately or we're not very accurate and this is the uncertainty so how we handle this uncertainty is quite important in risk analyses this is why i want to first tell you a bit about the study by Pate cornell that was done in 1996 uh, and Pate Cornell looked at different types of risk analysis approaches, how they were done and what made them different. Now, Pate Cornell's objective, as stated in, in her paper, was that she wanted to examine levels of analytical sophistication in uncertainty analysis for different types of risk analysis approaches. So how did they handle the unknown? You can do it in different ways. You can do it in a conservative way, so you're on the safe side. You can try to quantify it as accurately as possible. And this was what Pate Cornell wanted to look at. She also wanted to transfer experience, examine if you could transfer experience, uh, experiences across different fields of application in her paper. But I'll focus less on that part. Now, what Pate Cornell found when she looked at different risk analysis approaches used in, in the US mainly across many different disciplines was that she could categorize these risk analysis approaches in terms of how they handled the uncertainty and she found that there were basically six levels of treatment of uncertainty hence the title which is uncertainties and risk analysis six levels of treatment now what Pate Cornell came up with was that there were six levels as I said and she started off with level zero Level zero is what we sometimes call hazard identification. So hazard identification is when we identify what is dangerous. So in a, in a fire situation, there could be a, a large pile of, of, um, uh, of garbage that could potentially be ignited. And if we identify that as a hazard, we can then address it. Now, as I said before, when you do a risk analysis and when you're analyzing risk, it's the a combination of frequency and consequence. So how is it frequency and consequence if you're just looking at the hazard? Well, what you're looking at is if it can happen, yes or no. So you're basically assuming if the, the hazard is there, there might be a fire. Uh, so if there is a pile of rubbish, it can ignite. So let's remove the pile of rubbish. So you're looking at the consequences in some sense. You know that it can happen. It can have bad consequences. And you're looking at, at the probability or frequency in terms of if it's there, it can happen. So you could say that you're looking at frequency as well as consequence, but a very rudimentary way. How do you handle uncertainty in this case? Well, you're ultra conservative. So if something is dangerous, then remove it. So that's how you handle uncertainty in this level zero. The next level is called level one, and Pate Cornell calls this the worst credit or worst case. So level one is the worst case scenario. So if we have this type of distribution between the consequences and the frequency of something happening, so the consequences you have greater and greater losses towards the right of the image, and then the frequency it increases up on the, the y-axis. So as you see from this, this is just a generic curve, but you can see from this that the, the really severe consequences, the frequency of that is typically quite low, but the lower consequences, the frequency is quite high. So when you're doing the worst case, you're typically looking at something at the far end of the spectrum. Now, Pate Cornell rightly identifies that this is not necessarily a, a good approach. It is used in some disciplines, but it's not necessarily a very good approach. The reason for that is that when you've come up with the worst case, you can probably find another case which is even worse. And depending on the history, what has happened in the past, 
you might change the worst case as time progresses. So for example, a high rise building, a number of years, say 50 years ago, we would not design that for a plane flying into it, but now we do. So there are some difficulties with worst case level one analyses. Now level two is called quasi worst case or plausible upper bound. This is when we try to find a relatively severe incident um, and um, so a relatively severe incident that is not the worst of the worst, but that is not incredibly unlikely. So we're looking at a worst credible case. So looking at our curve again, rather than being at the far end, we might be looking at the tail of the distribution. The tricky thing here is where are we? So what value should we use? Should we use the 95th percentile? In many cases, it is quite hard to determine how safe is safe enough using this approach, since we're assuming a worst credible case. How do we know it's worst credible? And I'll tell you a bit about how we do that in fire safety engineering. But it is a bit tricky, since how do you know that you've hit the 95th percentile or whatever uh, percentile you're aiming for? And this is quite tricky. But in fire safety engineering, you will see that a lot of our analyses are at level two still. Now, level three, Pate Cornell said, that's when we uh, try to, to do an estimate based on the central value. So for example, if we have an event tree, as you see down here, we're just focusing on the more, the, the average outcome. So uh, it might be if we have three different fire sizes, then we take the average fire size, so the, the expected fire size. And then you might have something that vary and we take the average. This means that we're doing a design for an average, which when you look in fire safety engineering is not actually used very much. Pate Cornell identified that if you look at economic risk, it, it makes sense. And if you're not that sensitive to great losses or, or making a lot of money, it could make sense to do the average uh, or the best estimate central value analysis. If you're looking at life safety and we're by nature risk averse, it might not make sense to look at the average number of people killed in a fire. But the way we handle uncertainty is that we take, in this case, we take the average values and we do a calculation for the average. The next step up is level four called probability and risk analysis. This you might have done if you're a fire engineer. This is typically when we do an event tree. So we might have different fire sizes in the first branching off. And then we might have sprinkler fails or sprinkler works or partially works. And then we assign distributions to those. And if we do a fine enough event tree, then we can start categorizing the risk curve. So rather than a curve here, you see I have dots along the curve. And you see that I'm starting to estimate the spread, which gives us an idea of the uncertainties in our analysis. So it's a better way of quantifying the uncertainties. In fire safety engineering, this is often the type of analysis we do if we do a more advanced analysis. And this is level four, probability and risk analysis. Pate Cornell also identified the next level, which is level five. So rather than just having an event tree, we might assign distributions. So uh, in our case, it might be distribution of fire sizes. And we have, let's say we have a lot of statistical data on fire sizes, then we can assign a distribution uh, and then do our calculations. And we can do that using a Monte Carlo approach where we simulate, we pick values, and we try to resolve the entire scenario space. Basically, rather than just having the, the, the dots along the curve, if we do enough simulations, we might be able to quantify pretty much the whole curve. And if we have enough good data and enough input, we could potentially categorize the risk. Uh, so we can categorize how the frequency varies with the consequence. And this is what we're looking for. So this is in one way, you could say the more advanced way of quantifying uncertainty. We actually know how certain we are if we do a really, really good analysis. Now, the difficulty is we can never reach perfection. There will always be uncertainties that we cannot quantify. But going from level zero with a very rudimentary treatment of uncertainty, basically just ignoring the, the frequency, just saying that if there is something, 
dangerous, then it will happen, and then addressing what is dangerous. So removing the pile of rubbish, that's level zero, to level five, where we try to quantify the distributions, and we do a lot of simulations and calculations, and we get a risk curve that describes how dangerous is our building. And then it becomes easier to say, is it safe or not, safe enough or not? So these are the six levels of treatment of uncertainty presented by Pate Cornell. And Pate Cornell didn't look at fire safety engineering. Pate Cornell looked general at different types of risk analyses that had been done in the US context in 1996. Back to our outline. I've talked about Pate Cornell, and now I'm going to tell you a bit more about the work that is done in ISO, and more specifically about a document called ISO 23932, uh, part one, and the latest version is from 2018 and is called General Principles. This document outlines how we do fire safety engineering, so how we do fire safety engineering design as well as fire safety engineering management or fire safety management. Uh, I'll talk general about ISO and then I will talk a bit more about the risk analysis approach and I'll try to link this back to Pate Cornell and Pate Cornell's categorization of different risk analysis approaches. Finally, I'll tell you, if you want to learn more, what to do. First, a bit about ISO. So ISO is short for International Organization for Standards. It was founded after the Second World War in 1947. Uh, and the headquarters of ISO is in Geneva, Switzerland. It's the largest developer of voluntary international standards. So in many countries you have standards, some of them are mandatory. ISO is all voluntary. The countries can choose to apply the standards or not, uh, or they can choose to be a member of certain committees or not. Uh, so it's all voluntary and on a voluntary basis, but it's world spread around the world. It has, ISO has 165 member states it's a relatively lean organization. They only have about 160 staff, but it relies on the many volunteers who go to ISO meetings, who contribute with their knowledge and expertise and help develop standards. Now, ISO has published uh, an amazing 23,131 documents since the start in 1947. Naturally, not all of them are in fire safety engineering. Now, how is ISO organized? Well, when it comes to fire, there is one group in particular that I will focus on, and it's called TC92 on fire safety. TC is for technical committee, so this is technical committee 92 on fire safety. Under this technical committee, there are subcommittees. So we have subcommittee one on fire initiation and growth. We have subcommittee two on fire containment. Subcommittee three, fire threat to people and the environment. So this is looking at such things as uh, toxicity. And then we have SC4, which is the group that I'm involved in, which is focusing on fire safety engineering. Uh, we also have three working groups. So working groups are groups where you do standards development. Uh, so there is one working group on statistical data collection, one on large outdoor fires and the built environment, and one on fire safety for tunnels. As I said, what I'll focus on here, since this is all about fire safety engineering, is SC4 on fire safety engineering. Now, SC, T, ISO TC92 SC4, how is that organized? Well, I'm the current chair. I'm chair until 2022. Uh, and we have a committee manager, Benoit, Benoit uh, and the secretariat is, is at AFNOR in France. Now, the members, we have 29 participating members and 16 observing men members. And currently in our group, we've published 27 documents and 14 that are currently under development. And it's all related to fire safety engineering, how you do fire safety engineering design, how you look at or how you calculate um, movement through smoke and those types of things. So it's, it's everything from general documents to very specific documents. Now, how is ISO TC92 SC4 organized? Well, we have working groups in the subcommittee, subcommittee four. So we have working group one, which is general principles and performance concept. And then we have other working groups um, focusing on other areas as well. 
Now what I'll focus on now is working group one on general principles and performance concepts. And the reason for that is that the document that I'm going to focus on, ISO 23932, was developed in working group one. So this is where all of the general documents, the general guidance documents are developed. Now ISO 23932, part one, is from 2018, the latest version, and it's called General Principles. Now this document is basically a guide to other documents. Uh, it, it, it is the go-to guide to know which other documents I should use in different parts of my fire safety engineering analysis or fire safety management. And it describes the fire safety engineering process. And the flow chart you see on the right side of the image is figure one, in the document. It describes how you do a fire safety engineering analysis. And I won't go into the detail, details of this flowchart. I just want to highlight some things and then I will focus on the risk analysis approaches. But you start off when you do fire safety engineering, you start off by setting a fire safety engineering scope. Since this document is focused on how do you do a design of, the, of a new building and how do you look at fire safety aspects when you design a new building. So first of all, you set the fire safety engineering scope. You then decide which fire safety objectives you're going to look at. So is it life safety, cultural heritage? Um, could it be firefighter safety? Let's assume it's life safety for now. Uh, that's the first step. You're looking at life safety and then you have to specify your fire uh, functional requirements. Now the functional requirements is the specification of the fire safety objective. So if you're looking at life safety, then a functional requirement might be, well, how are people safe? Well, don't expose them to toxic products, smoke, soot, um, heat, radiation, and so on. So that's the functional requirement. The next step in the flowchart is that once you've decided, I want to protect people, I don't want them to be exposed to smoke and toxic gases, then you choose your risk analysis approach. Now, this is what I'll focus on here. Since in this document, we outline the different type of risk analysis approaches that you can use. And we use the Pate Cornell approach to describe them. Before this document, it wasn't, or this version of the document, the 2018 version of the document, it wasn't perfectly clear what a risk analysis was in, in the area of fire safety engineering. But now we've done a lot of revision of the document and it's built, it's, it's based on Pate Cornell's categorization. So this is what figure two looks like in the document in ISO 23932. Uh, so basically uh, this figure describes the different types of risk analysis approaches you can use in fire safety engineering. Before we continue, there are two things I wanna highlight. In this document, we describe that you can do two types of analyses. You can do something called a comparative analysis. Now, this is when you're doing a performance-based design. So you're doing a risk analysis to estimate how safe the building is. Now, when you're doing this, you need something to compare with. You know, need to know if it's safe enough. If you do a comparative approach, the way you do it is that you look at the equivalent prescriptive building. So if you would have followed the prescriptive regulations rather than performance based. So the prescriptive is when you just follow the paragraphs and you design the building according to the rules of the legislation uh, or the building code. And you can do that for many buildings, but many times you want to make deviations. But you do your default building based on the building code. And then you calculate how safe is that? So how many people die per year? What's the societal risk and so on? That's your baseline. And then you modify your building. You do a trial design. You calculate how safe that building is. So what is the risk? So you do a full risk analysis for that alternative design. And then you compare to the prescriptive design. And if fewer people die in your design, your alternative design than in the prescriptive, then you, you feel confident that this is at least safer than the prescriptive building. And this is the comparative approach. This you can use in some cases, particularly when you're making small deviations from a prescriptive building, so where you just follow the building codes and the paragraphs in the building code. But if you're taking large steps away from it, let's say you're designing a, a, a 50, story building which is not allowed in some jurisdictions at least you're not allowed to build that tall buildings using prescriptive so you have to use performance-based design 
So if that's the case, and that's I know this is the case in Sweden, so if that's the case, then you have to you do an absolute approach. The absolute approach, you as a designer often have to choose the tolerability criteria yourself. You don't have a performance-based building where you can sort of implicitly derive what the, the, the tolerability criteria are, but rather you have to say, well, this is what I consider safe enough. And this can be quite tricky. Legislation around the world, to be honest, doesn't offer a lot of guidance in this area. Uh, there are some exceptions. There is a new Insta standard, which does give you some values that you can use. It gives you societal as well as individual risk. But in many cases, you as a designer, you have to decide, this is what I consider to be safe enough. And then you have your tolerability criteria, you do your trial design, you do your risk analysis, and you get a measure of the risk. And you can compare it to your tolerability criteria, and if it doesn't fulfill it, then you have to redo your design until you have a building that is safe enough. So that's the comparative and absolute. But what I'll focus on now is a different type of risk analysis approaches and how it links to the research by Pate Cornell. Now, the first level, the most basic level that is often used in fire safety engineering is what we call the qualitative analysis. The qualitative analysis is similar to level zero of Pate Cornell. Uh, in, and what you do in a qualitative analysis is that you have your performance based or you have your prescriptive building and you want to make deviations. So a silly example could be that you don't want to use the detectors that are prescribed in the prescriptive regulations, but you want to use something else. Now, you've done a deviation from the prescriptive. And what you need to do then is to, to look at this deviation and estimate, well, is this a hazard or not? Is this dangerous or not? Um, and you can also look at, at um, for example, if you choose a detector and it actually gives you a shorter detection time, it's a no brainer, I would say. You could just change to that detector, but you still have to document this and you can do this in a qualitative analysis. And this is similar to Pate Cornell's level zero. Now what differs in the current version of ISO 23932 to previous versions is that in previous versions you wouldn't consider this to be a risk analysis approach. But going back to Pate Cornell, hazard analysis is a risk analysis approach which treats uncertainty at a very basic level but it still treats both frequency and consequences. And it is a way of treating the uncertain. So that's the qualitative analysis. Now, you can also choose to do a deterministic analysis. To be honest, a lot of analyses that are done are what we call deterministic analysis. What do we mean by deterministic analysis? Well, this is level two, according to Pate Cornell. So this is worst credible case or plausible upper bound or quasi worst case, whichever you choose to call it. But this is when we do an analysis where we choose a handful of scenarios which are quite severe, not the worst, but quite severe. Now, how do you know what is severe enough? Since what you do is you, you choose these five relatively severe fire scenarios, you expose the building to these fire scenarios, and if people survive, they're not, they're, they, they don't get overcome by smoke, they don't, they're not exposed to really high uh, radiation levels, uh, then you say that your building is safe. Now, the th tricky thing is, how do I know I've chosen severe enough fires? Well, it's tricky. The reason, and, and since it is tricky, many countries around the world have provided you with the scenarios. So this is the approach in New Zealand, for example. They have CVM2, where you get a number of scenarios that you should expose your building to. And the idea behind it is that this is a worst credible set of scenarios that your building should be able to cope with. Going to Sweden, you have a document called BBRAD, which does the same. It gives you a couple of scenarios, it specifies the values, and then you expose your building to those scenarios. If people still survive, you have a level of robustness, and it's given by the legislation in both Sweden and New Zealand. You at least get, get suggestions of which scenarios you should use if you have no reason to choose something else. So in some sense, the legislation has set the criteria, set the scenarios that you should expose your building to in the deterministic analysis. The final 
risk analysis approach that are used sometimes in fire safety engineering is the probabilistic analysis. And this is at the level five or four or five. And this is when you create event trees or you assign distributions to the fire size and fire growth and other aspects. Uh, and you do a Monte Carlo simulation. Now, to be honest, this might not be used a lot in fire safety engineering. It's mainly used if you have very complex and large buildings, if you have infrastructure projects, this could be worth putting that extra effort in uh, to get a good idea of how dangerous the tunnel actually is. So that's the probabilistic analysis. Now the difference compared to past versions of 23932 is that we've made this quite explicit in the document. We say that these are all risk analysis approaches. We don't actually say they're linked to Pate Cornell, but when writing it, Pate Cornell was in the back of our mind and her way of, of of categorizing risk analysis approaches in the different levels depending on how they treat uncertainty. So going back to the general flowchart, uh, we were at the risk analysis approach. Once you've decided on your risk analysis approach, you go to the next step, which is your performance criteria. This is how you measure that the functional requirement is not violated. And the reason this is actually be after the risk analysis approach. So first you choose if you do a deterministic analysis or if you do a, a, a probabilistic analysis and then you decide your performance criteria. The reason for that is that your performance criteria are quite different if you're doing a deterministic or a probabilistic analysis. So if you're doing a probabilistic analysis, your criteria might be, well, people should not die more often than once in a million years. So you have the, the consequence and the probability. If you're doing a deterministic analysis, you're assuming worst credible case scenarios, and then no one can die or be exposed to untainable conditions. So it is quite different. And that's why the performance criteria are after risk analysis approach or the selection of risk analysis approach. And this is also a change in the document. I won't go through the rest of the flow chart, uh, but if you're interested, I suggest you read ISO 23932 to see what the flowchart looks like and the different steps that you have to do in the fire safety engineering analysis. Now, did you find this interesting? Do you want to learn more? Well, there are a couple of different options that I can suggest. So if you want to learn more, I suggest reading Pate Cornell. It is a bit of an eye opener if you're not aware of this area from before. So the publication by Pate Cornell, I definitely suggest. If you're interested in knowing more about fire safety engineering and the general principles document, I suggest reading ISO 23932 uh, part one from 2018, since it explains the fire safety engineering process and how you do a risk analysis. It's at a relatively high level, but it outlines the process. Now, if you're still interested to learn even more, I suggest taking a course. Uh, I would suggest, for example, the University of Canterbury courses in, in New Zealand, since those are the ones I know best. Uh, so there is one course called ENCI 601 on risk management. This is not focused on fire safety risks necessarily. There's one part of the course focusing on that, but it is general risk management and general risk analysis. So this is an example of a course that you can take. You can find similar courses at other universities. And if you're interested in fire safety engineering and you don't have a fire safety engineering degree, there is a Master of Engineering in Fire Engineering at the University of Canterbury, but there are other universities around the world who have a similar degree, either at bachelor's level or at master's level. So what did we cover today? Well, first of all, I told you a bit about what a risk analysis is. And more specifically, I focused on the study by Pate Cornell, which was a revolutionary study at the time. And Pate Cornell looked at a range of different risk analyses that had been done around the US mainly. And she found that you could categorize them in terms of how they treated the uncertainty. And she found a system with six levels of treatment of uncertainty from zero to five. We then talked about risk uh, analysis uh, approaches in fire safety engineering and I presented the document called ISO 23932 part one from 2018 called general principles. I told you a bit about the general stuff in the document and a bit about ISO and then I told you about risk analysis approaches 
and how the document links up with Pate Cornell and the study by Pate Cornell. And finally, I told you a bit more about where you could learn more, either on your own or if you want to take a university course.